I want to talk to you today about, um, and stop me if I get too excited and speak too fast. I know you all speak English perfectly, but I get really excited sometimes. I have a few students in this room who for some reason came back for more punishment, but they know how excited I get. So I want to talk today about one of Hayek's, you all know who Hayek is, right? You've all breathed the air of the university. Um, one of Hayek's principal essays from 1948, which is The Intellectuals and Socialism. How many of you have read it? Okay, it's okay. It's not his most important essay. You should be reading The Constitution of Liberty first. You should be re uh, reading The Road to Serfdom first. You should be reading um, The Use of Knowledge in Society first. This is, however, an important essay because it has influenced pretty much the entire international freedom movement. You've probably heard at some point of the Atlas Network, uh, which is a think tank of think tanks based in Washington, D.C. It doesn't produce its own research, but it helps think tanks around the world that are dedicated to things like liberty, rule of law, individual freedom, economic freedom. Por una sociedad libre sin coerción ni privilegios. That might sound familiar. CAS is one of this. And I had the opportunity to meet Musso once or twice through... Uh, Musso Ayal through the, um, of course, you're all so young, you know the stories, but you probably didn't have an opportunity to meet Musso Ayal at any point. But, so if you get a chance to corner Fernando Monterroso or others, be sure to ask him about Musso Ayal and tell stories. This is the essay that influenced the freedom movement, that influenced the Thatcher revolution, that influenced what the freedom movement is doing around the world. And at 75 years, I think it's a good opportunity to stop and ask some questions about whether Hayek was right. Now, I say that with great fear. Was Hayek right? He's my favorite economist. He's wonderful. He's the greatest, I think, the greatest social thinker of the 20th century. You are fortunate to be at UFM where you read Hayek as part of your classes, regardless of your major. Hayek is, I think, the most important thinker of the 20th century, but I will ask if he was correct in his theory of social change. So this is ultimately a 30, 40-minute 40, 40 talk or so about social change. If anything's unclear, please stop me. So the good news, let's always start with good news. Let's get you inspired here. Let's get you excited. Before 19, when was UFM founded? 74? 71? Early 1970s, UFM is founded. Before the early 1970s, I would not have had this many students in Guatemala come listen to a lecture about Hayek. The freedom movement is growing. There is good news. Every state in the United States has a think tank dedicated to advancing liberty. The Atlas Network is now at the heart of about 180 think tanks around the world. Some countries still don't have any. Even China has one. Vietnam, I don't think, has a think tank, but there are some Austrian economists in Vietnam I've met. And there is good news. The small institutions in the 1970s, there seemed to be something in the air in the 1970s. The Cato Institute, the Institute for Justice, which litigates liberty. CEES, the think tank that is at the core of Marroquin. Marroquin University itself, the Universidad de las Esperides, which is just a year old now. All of those things, Students for Liberty, all those things are expanding, and that is the wonderful news. But we also have some bad news. I don't want to make this talk about the US, but I'm giving a similar talk in about three weeks at a US conference. So I want to start with some big figures to scare everybody. Just over the past 50 years, the United States debt adjusted for inflation has gone up from 3 trillion, 3,000 billion, it's not a number I can comprehend. It's gone from 3 trillion to 30 trillion. Federal spending in the United States has doubled. The price index for the non-economists here, this is basically a measure of inflation, has gone up by seven, a factor of seven. The weight of the central bank in the economy, the balance sheet, from 5% to 33%. And around the rest of the world, there was so much hope. And then bad things started happening. 1957 in Rome, the European countries get together and say, enough, enough. We're neighbors, we should be trading instead of fighting. They start the European Union. But it's a customs union in the beginning. It means you can trade freely and it's wonderful. But then the bureaucrats take over. 
And then suddenly it becomes a big regulatory factory in Brussels that is going to tell you things like how many toilets you need compared to how many offices in a building. And they're now working on cutting emissions of uh, carbon dioxide by 30% by 2030 and zero net emissions in 2050. It's going to be an economic disaster if that happens. There are ways to save the environment without killing the economy. They're not doing it. Latin America. Latin America in the, 18, in the 1980s and 1990s was full of hope. It was the end of the military dictatorships, the end of the civil wars, the return to civilian rule, two or three decades of liberal economic expansion. And then what do we see in Latin America? Chavismo in Venezuela. Um, Ecuador going that same direction. Chile, three years ago with a, a proposed constitution that is going to rewrite the entire country after the Chilean miracle. Argentina, you thought Peronism was bad? Put in the Kirchners in office and then you'll see how bad that is. Quadrupling the rate of poverty in 10 years. And then what do we get in Argentina? Javier Milei. So there's some hope there. But we see even China after the disasters of Mao in the 19, uh, early 1980s, China opens up its economy. There is hope for liberty. And then 10 years later, there are liberal movements in China. But what happens in Tiananmen Square, 1989? The army gets sent in to crush them, and we have a rise of authoritarianism in China. And China is even more authoritarian and controlling now than it was back in the 1970s. We have now a rise internationally of national conservatism. It used to be that Friends of Liberty could make alliances with conservatives because both were interested in individual liberty and a small state. And now the conservatives are looking at things like closing borders and ending commerce. You've probably all heard of uh, Frédéric Bastiat, the French economist from the 19th century, who said, when goods do not cross borders, soldiers will. And this national conservative movement is trying to push for more isolation, less commerce, less immigration. So we have some bad news throughout the world, just as we have some good news. So the question then, who is advancing liberty? You probably recognize at least some of the figures here. We have at the top some of the US-based think tanks. Of course, Universidad Francisco Marroquin, right here. Congratulations. You are the future of liberty. All of you. And for those who are interested, I can share the PowerPoint. I know your generation likes to take pictures on your cell phones, but I'm, I can share the PowerPoint also. But we have also some intellectuals. I have at the bottom left a libertarian congressman in the US who might offer some hope. Um, I like to think that some professors are, so I have a picture of myself, but also Juan Ramon Rayo, based in Madrid, who makes more videos per day than I have made in my entire life explaining Austrian economics. The book tradition is also very important. So who's advancing liberty? But the problem is, stop for a second. We have the liberty movement over here expanding drastically over 50 years. We have national states, on the other hand, also expanding drastically. What are we doing? What's happening? The Cato Institute is bigger. The Institute for Justice is bigger. Marroquin is bigger than it was in the 1970s. We're growing the movement. And yet, we're seeing a regress of liberty around the world. So what are the problems? I think we have some problems in the freedom movement that we need to talk about. There's obviously a competition for scarce resources. This is what you talk about in economics classes all the time. There are some problems with echo chambers. That indicates you get a bunch of friends of liberty who come together and they talk about Hayek for three days. It's great fun. But what are we doing? How are we advancing liberty? How do we change a broken political process? You know all about this in Guatemala. Fights within the Supreme Court, fights about the Constitution, candidates getting canceled and the political party getting canceled. How do we measure effectiveness in the advance of liberty? How do we break through a political system? Politicians follow, they don't lead. And politicians like power, and they like taking money from these people here on this side and giving it over here to buy votes. But don't worry, because at some other point, they'll take money from you 
and they'll give it to you to buy votes. So everybody in the end ends up getting taken away. We still have a profound big bureaucracy. How do we overcome that? Broken education and economic illiteracy. You are not representative of Guatemala. You are not representative of 18 to 25 year olds because you read much more. You know a lot more. You ask a lot of questions. Your professors force you to ask questions in small classes. But by and large, we have economic illiteracy, so voters like to vote for policies that don't work, but give them immediate benefits. And we have increasing dependence on the state. If you receive your check from the state every week, you won't want to vote for smaller government, even if it's good for you in the longer run. So how do we break through all of that? I want to propose two theories. One is from a former professor uh, here at Marroquin University, but I suspect most of you haven't met him because he left about 10 years ago, Wayne Layton, uh, who is now working in telecommunications. And um, a professor friend of mine who is now in Nor uh, Western North Carolina called Edward Lopez, and they've got a book on social change. And the second, coming to our friend Hayek, after 75 years, the intellectuals and socialism. Leighton and Lopez propose a theory based on Hayek, and they say ideas will change the institutions, the institutions will change the outcomes towards liberty and towards prosperity. And then they propose a number of case studies. Then we have Hayek's article from 1949, The Intellectuals and Socialism. And Hayek explains the politicians will not change the system. The politicians will not lead. The politicians will follow because the politicians want votes and they want power. So how do we change the world to make it a better place? We change the ideas. We change the ideas and we change what is acceptable and we change the education and we teach the people who are important in the society, the people who are going to be making the decisions, and eventually we will teach the voters. And we leave the practical problems, the compromises to the politicians because the politicians will follow, the politicians will not lead. So this is Hayek's theory. And Hayek's theory gets picked up throughout the 1940s and 50s into the creation of an international freedom movement. But we have to ask if Hayek was right. Was Hayek right about changing the ideas? And not because the politicians are the ones who can change the laws. So even if we change all the ideas, there needs to be a transmission mechanism. In my dark days, my sad days, I think to myself, I have trained many good students. What are they going to do now? They're going to go out and train more good students. But how does that advance liberty? We need some other mechanism between the ideas and the politics. Was Hayek complete about that? How has that happened? So one way we can look at that is look at history. Where does social change come from? How do ideas change over time? I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I want to give you two examples from history and look at other cases of how ideas can change over time. The first one, I've got a lot of pictures up here, but I'll talk about it. In the 1970s in the US, there was a high level of regulation, especially in telecommunications, trucking, and airlines. Now, I have in my pocket a phone that looks very common to you because you all have one. I contend that without the regulatory change, the change in ideas that happened in the 1970s, you would not have cell phones and we would still have phones attached to the walls because up until the late 1970s, people considered that telephones were what we call in economics a natural monopoly. You can only have one set of phone lines. It's pretty stupid to have two or three sets of phone lines duplicating the efforts and wasting resources. So let's have only one set of phone lines. That means that we have one telephone company that handles 
local calls and one telephone company that handles all the long distance calls. And I don't know the exact date for Guatemala, but I imagine Guatemala had a telephone monopoly up until probably the early 1990s is my guess. Correct me if I'm wrong by a few years, but that is my guess about Guatemala. Most countries had a national monopoly on telephones and telephones were expensive. It was expensive to make a phone call and sometimes you had to wait until seven o'clock at night to make a phone call, which well, sounds completely foreign to all of you. You had to wait until night because it was cheaper to make a phone call. I remember when I was a child living in the US, my grandparents were in France, we could not dial them directly. We had to go through an operator and read the number and then the operator would call. And now, because of the regulatory changes, we have this wonderful phone in our pocket. You might have seen the picture on Facebook or Instagram or whatever you're using these days. All the things that are captured in this telephone. This telephone represents 50 boxes of CDs. This telephone represents a phone directory. It represents an encyclopedia. It represents a telephone. It represents a stereo system. And we have it in our pockets because of the deregulation that happened in the late 1970s in the US. And we had the same thing with trucking and airlines. If you're ever uncomfortable on a plane today, and you know how uncomfortable airplanes are, right? You have about this much room and this much room, but it's so cheap compared to what it was in the 1970s. Because in the 1970s, if you wanted to fly a commercial plane between two cities in the US, you had to ask for permission from the federal government and you had to demonstrate that there was a market need for one more flight or one more airline to operate between two cities. So of course there was very little competition and of course things were very expensive. So you can imagine the plane ticket was very comfortable, but how would you prefer if you fly back to the US? You go visit the US, you go visit some friends in the US, you go take a class in the US, you're uncomfortable for three or four hours, but you pay how much? 400 US dollars maybe for a flight? Back then, you could have had a much more comfortable flight, but it might have cost you in today's dollars, 5,000 or 7,000 US dollars. You still have that option today with business class, but you can also fly for very cheap. You can cross the Atlantic. You can go to Madrid to go visit um, the Hesperides University Studios. And you can get to Madrid from here for about $1,000 to $1,500. Not the $10,000 that it would have cost in the 1970s before the deregulation. So there was a story of deregulation in the 1970s that was a story of the left and the right working together. It all started with some economists in the regulatory agencies saying, regulation is inefficient, we have to stop it. By accident, there was a president in office, Gerald Ford, who was instinctively in favor of markets. So he supported this. The left was in favor of deregulation. The left usually loves big government. But the left was in favor of deregulation because there was high inflation, and they saw that inflation and that, deregula that regulation leads to higher prices. So there was a combination of free market instincts over here and pro-consumer voices over here. And then before you know it, we have deregulation. You can now get cheap flights. So think about this, the next time that you travel to the US or you travel to another country for a student conference or to visit friends and you're uncomfortable, but it's super cheap and you can actually do it. And I think about this all the time as a professor. I travel all the time. I'm in the middle of a five week tour right now to um, Spain, and Greece and Guatemala and the US, and then I go back home to Paris in France at the end of five weeks. And I can afford all of this. There's a little help along the way, but I can afford all of this thanks to that gentleman on the upper right with the funny looking nose and mustache. That's Alfred Kahn. After the deregulation, he would sit in the back of the airplanes in the cheap seats that were uncomfortable. And while everybody was complaining about how uncomfortable they were, he would sit there with a big smile on his face because he did it. He was the one who pushed for the deregulation that allows all of us now to get cheaper airline tickets to travel around the world in a way that we could not have 30 years ago. So think about that the next time you go to the US, 
to Spain, to wherever it is you go for a student conference or for an internship, thanks to Alfred Kahn, you were able to do that. Same thing, the telephone's in your pocket. Think about the fact that deregulation in the early 1980s allowed you to have this powerful phone in your pocket. The second example we can look at is Margaret Thatcher and her revolution in the 1970s, when England was very poorly. England was a poor country. England was in some ways still recovering from World War II and the consumer deprivations that it had. England had very strong trade unions, which were able to block commerce. And the story that we have is the Hayekian story of the transmission of ideas into policy. Hayek said, we need to divide the work. We have the professors, we have the Mont Pelerin Society, which I'm sure you've heard of at some point. It had a meeting, it's had at least two meetings here in 2009 and again in 2021. Gabriel Calzada, who's probably a famous name to all of you here, the former rector of this university, is currently the president of the Mont Pelerin Society. Musso Ayao was a past president of the Mont Pelerin Society. And then that's why I like to say little old me, I'm just a member, but I've been a member for 15 years, so I get to visit with all these great people. Hayek said, we have the generators of ideas, but normal people don't read academic journals. People on the street don't read academic journals. You read academic journals, I read academic journals, but normal people don't read academic journals. Normal people are not interested in that. So we need a translation, and for Hayek, the translation was the Institute of Economic Affairs, founded in 1955. And the job of the Institute of Economic Affairs was to take the academic journals and translate them in a way that people could understand through the radio, through the television, and you don't have 25 pages of boring academic work. It's okay. I write some stuff, I try not to make it too boring, but you've all read a boring paper at some point. And the idea was to translate it into something interesting that people could understand that would shape their ideas and think, oh, maybe liberty is a good thing. Maybe regulation is a bad thing and is making us all poor. So from there, Hayek had the Center for Policy Studies and the Adam Smith Institute, named after Adam Smith, of course, which would then take the ideas and digest them for the politicians and change them into policy. Well, it took about 20 years, but Margaret Thatcher rises. And Margaret Thatcher is able to take England from a poor country called the sick man of Europe into a country that is now routinely in the top 15 or so economically free countries of the world through the application of the ideas. And Margaret Thatcher had read Hayek. Margaret Thatcher knew the people at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Margaret Thatcher was, in fact, employed the people from the Center for Policy Studies and the Adam Smith Institute to help her with the legal and institutional changes. So we have here an example that worked of changing the ideas to influence the voters so that the voters could understand the importance of economic freedom and personal liberty, and then having the policymakers craft the institutional and political changes. So there are many other case studies, and I suppose this is my invitation to you. I don't have time to write all of them, but if any of you are interested, I know, you're students, you have a lot of work, that's good. The harder you work now, the easier your life will be afterwards. But if any of you are interested in writing a case study with me, please let me know because I would like to write more case studies to try to understand social change and where it comes from. France, from 1946 to 1981, France had right-wing governments. France slowly built a coalition of socialists, and in 1981, the socialists came in. I don't like socialists. I mean, I'm sure they're very nice people, but I don't like socialists and their policies, but I can learn something from them. How did they do it? In the early 1900s in the US, the United States Supreme Court was very strong about protecting the economic freedoms under the US Constitution. You know how much that has changed in the past century. Imagine now, it's 1900, 
and you are a so-called progressive. This is the lighter version of the social democrats in the US. And you are sitting in your office and you are frustrated because the Supreme Court has struck down yet another social welfare law that would make everybody's life better because it's not constitutional and it violates economic freedom. You're angry. What do you do? How do you change the climate of ideas? And the left has been very good at this in many countries, capturing education, capturing the media, and through capturing the media, capturing the popular mind. You may have heard of the Italian communist, Antonio Gramsci. His theory was, you can't fight the capitalist state directly because it's too strong. What you can do is a long march through the institutions. Over a generation or two, you can walk your way through the institutions and change the institutions and change them for yourself. And this is what the left has done in Western Europe, in Latin America, in the US, going through the institutions that change people's minds, going through the institutions of education, the media, journalism, civil society, to influence from the inside and capture them playing a long game. Incidentally, this is what China did in Hong Kong. So when Hong Kong was turned over from a British possession, a British territory over to China, I always forget if it's 89 or it's 1999, sorry. Hong Kong had a basic charter of individual liberty for 50 years. But the Chinese communists are smart. They're evil, but they're smart. And what they started doing immediately is trying to influence the institutions. So the Chinese communists quietly in 1999 started taking over the police. They started taking over the educational system. They started taking over civil society, clubs and organizations. They started taking over the press slowly, which means that in 2019, Simple mathematics will tell you 1999 plus 50 is not equal to 2019. There were another 20 years left, 30 years. China was able to pass a national security law that effectively killed democracy in Hong Kong. And the way it was able to do that was through a long-term influence of the institutions. We had in England the end of slavery without war. In the United States, it took a four-year war with half a million dead. How did William Wilberforce do that in England? There's something to be learned there. Smoking. I won't say who it is, but a Spanish friend of mine who came to work at Francisco Marroquin some years ago was interviewing for the job here. And he realized that you're not allowed to smoke on the Marroquin campus, except for what, one or two small areas? I'm not pointing at anybody because I don't want to embarrass anybody. But if you go back to the pictures or the stories, I would imagine that when this university was first started, there was probably smoking in the classrooms. Most of you find that shocking. Yeah? I find that shocking. Something changed over 50 years. Your parents may have told you stories about smoking sections on airplanes. Now, you know an airplane is closed. And it's got pressurized oxygen inside. So if the person on the other side of the plane is smoking, you might as well be smoking. You may have seen in the movies, smoking sections in restaurants. And when you came home, your coat smelled like an ashtray. That has changed. It's a mentality that has changed. You would be setting aside the fact that there would be formal consequences. Like I might be asked to leave the campus. If I were to light a cigarette right now, I don't smoke, but if I were to light a cigarette right now, you would be shocked at my behavior because that's not something that you do. That changed in less than 50 years. What happened? Was it the laws that changed the mentalities or was it the mentalities that changed the laws? Ending segregation in the US. So up until the mid-1960s, the United States had essentially an apartheid system based on racial segregation. What changed? And I have some acronyms up here, the Southern Conference, uh, Christian Leadership Conference, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or the Supreme Court. Was it fundamentally a change in ideas, or was it a legal change? Did change come from the bottom up or from the top down? The Jasmine Revolution, 10 years ago, 
The Arab world is on fire. People go to the streets and they try to work for democracy. Why then? What happened? What's happening in Iran today? Post-military democracy in Latin America. Throughout the, 19, well, throughout the entire 20th century, Latin America suffers from a string of military coups, civil wars. There hasn't been a military coup since the 1980s. There have been some shady circumstances. It was Honduras, there was some Celaya, I think, 10 years ago, but that's a different, but it wasn't a full military coup. What changed in the mentalities? What changed in the laws? Environmentalism, the new religion of Europe. I love the outdoors. I love the environment. But I'm also an economist, and I'm aware that resources are scarce and that we have to be intelligent about the way we save the planet. But something changed over the past 50 years. You see recycling bins everywhere. In uh, Europe, everything has to do with your carbon footprint. When I bought my plane ticket to come over here, I had the option to pay an extra 50 euros for offsetting the carbon footprint of my flight. I just, um, moving now into an apartment in Paris, I did not buy an electricity contract. The name of the contract was a contract for electricity, renewable energy, and green protection. All I want is electricity so I can run my computer. But they sold me all those things because what changed? What changed in the mentalities over 50 years? And then finally, Javier Millet, what happened with him? Why was he able to come up? So with that, as I start to close this lecture, and I'll leave just a few minutes for questions, was Hayek right? How do we change the world for a better place? How do we advance liberty? Was Hayek right about ignoring politics and focusing first on the climate of ideas? Not through the professors. No, nobody wants to read professors. You're students, you know that. But through the people who change the ideas, through the think tanks, through the media. Do we continue doing, after 75 years, what Hayek offered? Do we continue with an emphasis on trying to change the climate of ideas and politics will follow? Or do we try politics? Millet is trying politics. Maybe that will work in Argentina. But things had to get really bad in Argentina before Millet was allowed to change. Or is there something different? One way I think maybe we can go forward is to focus our efforts. The freedom movement tends to be all over the place. There are the environmental freedom people, the education freedom people, the tax freedom people, the free speech freedom people, political freedom people, economic freedom people. Maybe we focus just on two things because freedom is ultimately about capacity and opportunity. To participate in the market, to participate in a life of human flourishing, you need to be capable of doing so and you need to have the opportunity to do so. Where does capacity come from? Education. That's why you're all here. But the fact that you made it to Francisco Marroquin means that you're already educated and you have a solid foundation so you can invest even more in your human capital. But education up to the age of 18 in almost every country of the world is a state monopoly or something close to it and has not been doing well. So maybe we focus on education and liberating it so people actually have skills that they can use. And then the second thing is opportunity and removing barriers to entry. We see barriers to entry everywhere around the world, making it difficult for people to work. It might be the difficulty of obtaining a property title which would allow you to borrow against your capital so you can expand your enterprise. It may be the cost of a state license that will allow you to engage in your work. Now, just for fun, in the United States, in order to be a paramedic, this is the person who sits in the back of the ambulance to save your life, you need 400 hours of training. That seems reasonable to me. If I get hit by a car or I slip and fall, I want somebody with at least 400 hours of training to save my life while the ambulance takes me to the hospital. Now, can you guess how many hours it takes on average in the US to get a state license to cut 
people's hair? 1,600. That's a full year of training. Now, how many people die every year from a bad haircut? You're in a university, you've seen a lot of professors with bad haircuts, but nobody dies from a bad haircut. So there has to be something else at play, and what it is is that there's not much money to be made in working in ambulance, but there is some money to be made in cutting people's hair, so if you can get a license to prevent people from entering the market, then you can reduce the supply and keep the prices up that you can charge people. So that makes perfect sense. But that also prevents people from entering, and this has a regressive effect. That means it's going to hurt poor people more. And all the time the state talks about helping poor people, et cetera, if you're a lawyer and you have to pay a state license, you can pay it. It's a small percentage of your income. But if you're trying to make a living and you want to cut people's hair and you have to take an entire year's worth of training, not to mention the payment for the training, you're not going to be able to do that and you will be much more, it will be much more difficult for you to get work, get a job. Last story, because I think you can think of examples from your own country. In the state of Louisiana in the US, where New Orleans is, and I know there's a cooking school here. Anybody in the cooking school, I recommend you spend some time in New Orleans because the cooking there is fantastic. After a conference, I took a, a cooking class there. Great fun. In the state of Louisiana, it is illegal to sell flowers without a license. And in order to get a license, you have to take a class, you have to pass a written examination, and you have to pass a test of arranging flowers that is judged by somebody who already has the license and who has an incentive to keep you out. Those are just some of the small examples. And I'll give you one last example, and you can think about one from Guatemala. In the 1980s in France, there was a revolt of the typesetters working at newspapers, the people who would actually prepare the letters to, for the printing, because of an evil new invention called word processing, which all of you take for granted. The problem was one person at a computer could now do the work of three people, because the person, now, if you have a paper to write, what do you do? You go to your computer, you type it up, and you print it. But back then, you actually had, before personal computers, you actually had to set the letters and use the ink to print. So there was a revolt of the typesetters in France in the late 1970s, early 1980s, because they feared that a third to a half of them would be losing their jobs. The compromise that they came up with was that there would be one person typing in the news into a uh, computer for it to be printed. And for every one person typing, there had to be, by law, one person watching over the shoulder of the person typing. We're, of course, diminishing economic value and preventing people from entering markets. So in conclusion, I don't know. I don't have the answer. I've been fighting with this for 15 years. And I have a privilege that you don't have. The privilege that I have is that I'm no longer a student. So I don't have 15 weeks to come up with all the answers. And I know sometimes as a student it's difficult because you start your class, you start your reading, and by the end of the semester you have to have that paper written. As a professor, I can think about it longer term. But I've been thinking about these ideas for about 15 years now and I still don't have the answers. I'm happy that Marroquin is growing. I'm happy that Esperides has started out. I'm happy that Students for Liberty has chapters around the world. I'm happy to see so many young people, fun for American studies, I'm happy to see so many young people interested in the ideas of liberty. But I'm also very worried about the growth of national states, the growth of taxes. Violence in Latin America presents a huge problem for the state because then how far do you want to go with democracy and rule of law versus solving the problem of violence and security so that there can be economic activity. These are all elements of bad news. But the good news is more and more people are talking about these ideas. The good news is we have changes at the local level. And the good news is your generation, you're a lot smarter than my generation. We learn things a lot more slowly. And my good news on all of this 
is that with technology, you will be able to bypass the state. I think your generation will continue to pay taxes as protection money to the mafia of the state. But then you can use technology to bypass the state with private alternatives that are more efficient and cheaper. You bank on your phones already. So the ability to have banking exchanges and pay each other through Venmo or PayPal is one way to get out of the state monopoly banks or the banks that are protected by the states. Many other examples. So with that, in the tradition of the Nobel Prize winner Douglas North, I'm never going to win a Nobel Prize, but I'm happy with that. Douglas North would intentionally give lectures even if they were not complete because he wanted to hear from the people in the audience and hear their ideas.